welcome to today's broadcast of North Idaho College Public Forum. The crew is comprised of NIC television students and your moderator is North Idaho College political scientist Tony Stewart. Today we bring you the fourth and final program in our series entitled South Africa, The Politics of Apartheid. Today we shall emphasize the discussion of apartheid versus racial equality, uh, what we've t subtitled it called a conscience. Our guest today comes to us from Atlanta, Georgia. She is a native of South Africa. Uh, she and her family have grown up in the civil rights movement in South Africa. In fact, her father was, uh, what one might say, the founder of the, the modern movement uh, in South Africa. Our guest is Mrs. Tandy Gabash, who, as I indicated, now lives in uh, Atlanta. Our guest holds a BS degree in nursing and physiology. In addition to her profession as a nurse, she is the mother of four children ages 23 through 16. Also our guest, as I've indicated, was for many years a civil rights and, or human rights activist in her country of South Africa. In 1970, she was barred from uh, living in her country and has been in exile since 1970. Today she serves as the director of the South African program for the southeastern region of the American Friends Service Committee. Uh, and she tours and speaks and uh, she's been gracious to be with us today on our campus to speak uh, to our citizens and to our campus community and to engage in this interview. Mrs. Gabosh, welcome to our campus and to this program. Thank you, Tony. And I'm happy as <coughs> always to welcome to the panel to assist in questioning our guest, uh, Janelle Burke, an Idaho attorney, and I'll ask Janelle to commence the questioning. Well, Ms. Gabosh, would you please begin the program and set the stage by telling us where you were born and how you grew up, what your family believed, and how you came to this country? Uh, Janelle, I was born in South Africa in a city called Durban, and that is where I lived for the first 36 years of my life. Uh, a city as I was growing up that was very segregated. In fact, more than segregated, really. I, I hate to use that term because uh, once I use it, people will begin to equate uh, what is happening in my country to the conditions that existed here before the civil rights movement. But the situation in South Africa is much, much more severe in fact, it's only comparable to the uh, situation of Nazi Germany before World War II. Uh, as a matter of fact, there's a book that uh, has been written by a black South African who is a civil rights F activist, Sipo Muzimela, entitled Apartheid South Africa Nazism. And that is very, very fitting I don't know how many people are aware that most of the present rulers of South Africa uh, uh, during World War II were on the side of Nazi Germany in the war. Although the policy of South Africa as a country was to be with the allied Western countries, but uh, some individuals sub were very anti-Jewish. Anyway. That's why I grew, up, I grew up in Devon, went to segregated schools. Uh, I was never taught by a white teacher until I went to university. That is amazing. And, uh, but that's how South Africa is. Now, I grew it, up in a family that is very political because my father, as I indicated before, uh, was president of the African National Congress the main opposition organization to the apartheid system. My father was killed in 1967 under very mysterious conditions. I was active in the movement after it had been outlawed in 1960, which me meant that we had to do everything secretly underground. Then I found myself being forced into exile in June of 1970 and ever since I've been living in Atlanta, Georgia. What does exile, being in exile mean actually to someone? What, what does it mean? Well, it means that for whatever reason, you can no longer remain in your country and you have to seek refuge in another country, which refuge I found in America. 
I cannot return to South Africa. If I did, I would be imprisoned. And how many people are in exile? How many people are in your situation who might be taking oh, exile here in the United States from South Africa? They are so many, hundreds of thousands, uh, just in Africa alone, particularly in the frontline uh, countries. These are the countries that are neighboring South Africa. It's easy for people to exit into them any time. Mozambique, Botswana, Zimbabwe, Zambia, Tanzania. Then there are many, many more in Europe, and of course some in North America, including the USA. Uh, I would estimate really uh, some millions of people are in exile. Mrs. Gabash, I want to uh, pursue uh, a somewhat of a definition of part time, but we've already had a lot this week uh, at the symposium here on this program too, the legal definition, all of that. I was so impressed today when you discussed with our students uh, what are really the uh, results of apartheid? Would you give us some uh, history of how uh, uh, the black community in South Africa has been treated and how the government has reacted to uh, your people during these years, particularly since 1948 when the government had this extra assertive effort to uh, enforce apartheid? Yes. <clears throat> you know, South Africa has always been ruled by whites since uh, 1652 when they first arrived. Oh, well, after many wars and then after they conquered us, they ruled. At first, the rulers of South Africa were English, uh, people of British origin. Now, at that time, we suffered discrimination and segregation a situation comparable to what happened here. But at, from 1948, the nationalists ascended to power, and these are Afrikaners, they're of Dutch origin. Unlike the British, they are not very subtle about the way they discriminate and segregate. In fact, uh, their idea was that uh, the British had spoiled black people, they had treated us too kindly, and that they had created black Englishmen out of the uh, African, and that uh, the Afrikaners were now going to put us in our place. Uh, the laws of apartheid are based, the cornerstone uh, of around which these laws are created uh, is based on preserving racial purity of white people. And hence, they do all they can to keep themselves as a pure race. The Immorality Act, the Segregated Residences, the Group Areas Act, and a host of other laws that are devised to make sure that there is no contact between black and white. You know, I honestly tell you, the only point of contact between black and white in South Africa is on the job, labor. And even then, it's under very clearly defined uh, uh, regulations of master and servant. And, and that is how race relations are in South Africa, and, and um, it's a very severe, unhealthy situation. Also, give us some uh, examples of how uh, when you are in public in South Africa, how the white race demands the, the black population to react to them and the dehumanizing aspects of that. Well, at uh, the symposium, I related a story of how in the past uh, race relations were of such a nature the African being put in his place, as I said before, such that uh, in the public streets, you could not meet a white person uh, and, and face to face. If you were walking, walking in the street uh, on the pavement and uh, a white person came along, you had to give way as a black person give way to the point where you crawl down on the ground because you cannot stand and be upright in the presence of a white person. Now, 
my father used to tell me about those stories. I didn't actually see that. But when I was grown up myself, I remember very well seeing um, African, old, grown up, respectable African men uh, in the presence of a white person. They would have to remove their hat and salute, actually salute, you know, salute that white man and uh, as a show of respect. Now, that kind of mentality, although we no longer cringe and crawl for white people, but the, that kind of mentality still exists in South Africa. White people expect us to behave like that to them. They expect us to be completely subordinate. And if you don't show that respect in some other ways, then you have to be put in your place. Janelle Burke. Then comes the big question, what do we do about these conditions? How can we make changes? What do you think can be done in order to make changes in this kind of attitude? How can we raise people's conscience? How can we make effective changes in the way th things are being done in South Africa? Well, Jeanette, I would first really say it's very important for American people to be educated on the issue. Inform yourselves so that whatever decision you take, it should be an educated one. Whether it be a decision to oppose apartheid or whether it be a decision to be for apartheid, it should be well informed. Now you can inform yourselves, educate yourselves by having people like myself and other South Africans to come and speak to you and inform you firsthand. As well as I'm not only confining this really to black South Africans, there's white South Africans who are well informed as well. And um, also using films, which I understand during this series, films have been very useful. But then there are other things that you can do. Material aid is very important. Refugees that I referred to are in dire need. For instance, the African National Congress has a school in Tanzania. The thousands and hundreds of children, school children, who had to leave after 1976 Soweto riots were stranded. Most of them, their education interrupted at a very tender age, and they needed education. So the African National Congress built a school called Solomon Matlangu Freedom College. We require funds, we require books, we require materials for that school. That's one project you can engage in. Also, inside South Africa, there is a need for help. You know, in the homelands, the situation is desperate and desolate. Uh, you can help by funding uh, uh, underdevelopment programs there, agriculture. Uh, build clinics, build schools, because you know the government of South Africa has no obligation to build schools and clinics for black people. Uh, black people do that for themselves. So you can help in very many ways I could. Uh, oh, let me mention one more specific, very specific way you can help. Uh, sanctions bill. Congress last year passed a sanctions bill but it is not good enough. It has weaknesses in it that need to be amended. Now, during the coming 100th Congress, we are going to be asking the American people again to put pressure on their public officials to support a stronger sanctions bill. So you can play a very, very important role there. I would like to also talk about uh, South Africa and uh, the parliament uh, and the government, some action they've taken recently, and I think Americans are unaware of uh, what has happened in that case. The South African government is putting out a lot of information that they've changed the law some concerning uh, the Asian Indian community and the colored community in relation to where they can vote and elect any representatives to the, the national uh, government. A lot of Americans take that to mean that's the entire population. And what I'd like for you to respond to is the fact 
that the black African population, which I understand is over 72 percent of the entire population, has no franchise, no vote at all. Uh, would you, I guess I have a two-part question. What was the motive behind the government to make this change with a very small percentage of the population and put this information out to the world? And secondly, um, what chances do you think, other than through these tremendous uh, efforts that are going to be uh, carried out by your people in South Africa and other nations, what is going to have to happen to break that uh, political barrier? In other words, if, if you're going to have a democracy, that cannot take place until every, every citizen of the country is part of that process of voting and selecting the leadership. Mm -hmm. Okay, first part of your question, what motivated the government to grant the limited political participation to the Indian and the colored? Probably I'll mention two reasons, but there are more. One is that the government has been under a lot of pressure to improve its image, particularly for overseas consumption. Not so much for uh, whether it is helpful to the black majority whom it is oppressing. So improve your image, the Western nations were saying, or else we're going to take strong measures against you. That was number one. Number two, in, uh, excuse me, in fact, all of the other reforms as well, like the repeal of the Immorality Act, like the repeal of the past laws, they say they're going to repeal them. All of those are just for overseas consumption. But now, going back to the vote again, the second reason why they extended it to the colored and the Indian, I believe, was to have manpower for the army. Now, having the vote, that is the Indian and the colored, also uh, entails responsibility to defend your country. There has been a movement to weaken the South African Defense Force by uh, some young white people. The end conscription uh, movement was becoming very strong and the government was running into problems about recruiting white people and having them stay in the army. So the colored and the Indian now will fill that vacuum. But let me just mention one other aspect of this extending of the vote to Indians and coloreds. Good as it might have looked for the South African government for public consumption, one thing that has not been emphasized is how it has actually not only excluded the African from the political system, but also for the first time the African lost her or his citizenship of South Africa. Because under the new dispensation now, all Africans are no longer citizens of South Africa, but they are citizens of whatever homeland has been designated to them. So hence the film that some of your students saw where African people were saying, South Africa belongs to us. Black people are reasserting their contention that South Africa, all of South Africa is their country, and they're not going to be confined just to some homeland what, or that has been designated to them. Janelle Berg. You are a civil rights activist. Sometimes we here in America, in the United States, find it easy to sit back and be comfortable. Why should we be involved in what is going on elsewhere in the world with respect to civil rights? I think you probably can speak eloquently about why one needs to be involved with civil rights no matter where one lives. Well, let me just say, Martin Luther once said, uh, uh, oppression anywhere is oppression everywhere, or something of the kind. This is a human issue. It's not just a, an issue of uh, white South Africans against blacks. It's an issue of all humanity. The magnitude of the uh, situation is such that if um, the conflict 
could escalate more. It could be the reason for World War III. So that every human being has a stake in solving this issue. That's one aspect of it. So I, I really would hope that people would care just from a humanity point of view and also self-interest in that this may cause World War III. But for our part, the suffering is real. It is for real. And we need it for it to end. And the only way to have it end, or one of the ways to have it end, is to remove the financial support for apartheid. And that financial support for apartheid comes from the multinational corporations. And hence, the movement for sanctions, the movement for divestment, is attempting to cut off that lifeline, you know, support for apartheid. You know, if you look at it, Janelle, there is no way that uh, 4.5 million white people could have such absolute control, absolute and utter control, over 26 million black people. Now, they are able to do so not only because of financing uh, uh, from the Western nations, including America, but also because of the military collaboration and also because of the technology that is provided by these companies, Te technology such as the computer, for instance. Influx control law laws are really made uh, to be enforced more uh, uh, accurately with the computer. I, I really could go on and on demonstrating to you how essential it is to remove this financial, technological, psychological, diplomatic, military support for apartheid. And that comes from uh, multinational corporations mostly. Another thing the South African government puts out, they've done uh, an extensive amount of that in the United States. Uh, they contend that through what they first described as homelands, now they're calling them states. They come to the United States and they compare that with our state government and say that they have given uh, mm -hmm. uh, decision making and government to the black African population in the home country and in the state. And they also contend that's where a lot of the decisions of government are made. And I'd like to give you this opportunity to respond to uh, that statement. And uh, I also would add by asking the question that aren't the greatest powers, first of all, uh, or most of the powers of government in South Africa at the national level. And that's where the control is. And secondly, uh, don't they also maintain control over those areas that they now want to call states? Mm -hmm. Well, these 10 so-called homelands are supposed to be autonomous and independent of South Africa, politically and economically. But all of us know that uh, they uh, exist because of Pretoria. The prime ministers who rule them, their paycheck comes from Pretoria. The, their budgets for running the governments come from Pretoria. The state of emergency that is existing in South Africa, so-called South Africa right now, is also extended to the homelands. The, uh, so um, these homelands are just extensions of Pretoria. Those of us who are really truly involved in liberating South Africa, we do not recognize the homelands as states or for whatever they are called. They may change names from time to time. We are fight, uh, uh, working towards liberating all of South Africa as one wholesome country. I have never known, Tony, in my life, any government, I've not heard of it, that legislates division, like the government of South Africa has done with us black people in South Africa. Most governments uh, legislate and work towards uniting their people because that makes for a smoother working of things. Now, also I challenge the government of South Africa 
by saying if the idea of creating these homelands for black people is such a good one, why don't they have white homelands? You know, there are so many groupings of white people in South Africa. There are the British, the Africaners, the French, the Germans, the Italians, all of them speaking different languages. They're not one homogeneous group of people, white people. But, but clearly, there is a plan behind a, a dividing us black people, and that is to weaken us so that the opposition to apartheid will not be as effective. Janelle Burke. Oftentimes on the news, we hear or read about violence that's going on in your country. Mm -hmm. Do you think the violence is going to get greater unless there is a responsiveness to the plight of the blacks? Certainly, uh, the violence is going to escalate, no doubt about that. It has been escalating, and um, there is no sign that it's going to take a reversal now. In fact, all of the indicators are that it's going to get worse and worse. The only thing that can minimize the violence will be for the Western nations to intervene by way of sanctions, as uh, we have been requesting. This, again, is really not going to entirely stop the violence and, and, and the bloody confrontation, but it will somehow minimize it. In, uh, what do I mean by that? Uh, for instance, it, it may force the white South Africans, once they are weakened economically, it may force them into the negotiating table when they no longer feel so strong. That's for one thing. Secondly, if the sanctions are implemented, people put up a scenario where the white South Africans will simply go into the lager, where they will circle the wagons and, and protect themselves and whatever <laughs> remains of the economy, they, they will hoard it. Okay. Now, that's going to really sharpen the confrontation much more quicker. And, and I don't think that's a bad idea. I'm so sorry to have to interrupt, but uh, the time is up. Unfortunately, on this program, we have to stop <laughs> when, the, when our time's up. Mrs. Gabash, on behalf of our staff and Janelle, we thank you very much. It's been most informative and very fine having you with us. Thank you. I'm sorry we had to end so abruptly. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, our guest has been uh, Mrs. Tandi Gabaj, who is a civil rights activist from South Africa. With this, we bring to close a four-week series on South Africa, the politics of apartheid. I hope you've enjoyed this series. We think it's a very important topic. And please be with us again next week at this same time. I am Tony Stewart. <laughs>